Good morning, sir. Can you tell, tell us a bit about your background in the energy sector, very storied career? Okay, so I s arrived from Scotland back in 1977, joined ESCOM and was part of the construction of their six-pack units in, uh, at Creel and Matla power station. Uh, I then moved to um, joined Arriva, or as it was then called, Framatome, and um, was part of the construction, start-up and commissioning of uh, Kubo nuclear power station. After that, uh, they wanted me to go, to go to Korea, quite like Cape Town, stayed, re rejoined ESCOM, part of their um, re refueling management team, and um, I think about 1990 or 1989, the end of 1989, 1990, I left as I was feeling a little bit of a round peg in a square hole, if, you <laughs> if there is such an expression. And I decided that um, maybe I could offer some good services to into the power industry in South Africa. Um, took over a small engineering company, providing engineering services, so more consulting type of services, and uh, built up um, the SETI from there. Um, shareholding with the OEM of Kuburg, which was Arriva, and um, had some empowerment shareholders. So that's really my history, you know, the background behind it. And I've been totally focused on the power business in South Africa. And the evolution of Kuburg Power Station is uh, probably about at least 30 years old now. Um, uh, maintaining that, to keep keeping it going all these years, some of the challenges there? Yeah, you're right. It was uh, first criticality, I think, was 84. And I think you'll probably see one of these, um, these uh, pictures there. Um, depicting the team that was um, during that time. So really when I started the business I was offering um, project management services, uh, getting involved in assisting them with um, fine-tuning the plant in the early stages. Uh, they had some, some things that they had to uh, sort out. And then obviously the, um, there was various different recommendations that came out either from the IAEA or from the licensing aspects or WANO to improve the operation of Kuburg. So there were some modifications that was completed and we got involved in those modifications. As well as the refueling outages. So we um, looked, uh, Lucetti looked after, and we have been doing for, uh, for since then, uh, most of the refueling outages activities on the nuclear island, which means looking at um, opening and closing various different vessels, doing the refueling of the reactor, um, valve and pump maintenance and things like that. And a very good safety record today, so what do you put that down to? Well, I live in Melkbos, which is right next door to the power station, so, so, so I'm very keen to make sure that it's, uh, it, it's in a very safe condition when it gets returned to service. And um, now I think the, the skill levels that we've developed on the maintenance side of it, uh, I'm very proud of that track record and the culture we've built up, the nuclear safety culture that we've built up to, to be able to operate it, you know, well not so much the operation that's been left to ESCOM to do, but many of the maintenance activities we've been involved with ESCOM and we feel that we're part of the, the ESCOM team and management of Kuburg. And the life cycle of the plant, how many more years do you, would you expect to get out of it? Well, it was originally designed for 40 years, um, but as you know, if you look after something very well, um, you can do some uh, life extension, and, and I think nuclear industry is going through quite a big um, evaluation of their um, of the operation of these plants, and certainly you can almost double it to probably to 80, but at the moment they're looking at uh, taking it from 40 to 60 years. So it's in another 10 years' time, it would have done its... 40 years and um, we're going to have a life extension to 20, which means that they do have to replace some components and obviously obsolescence, I mean the plant was designed in um, uh, and a lot of the equipment was procured in the late 70s, so there's was quite a bit of obsolescence which should keep our teams busy re-engineering some of the parts of the plant. And how much of that engin engineering is done in South Africa? We very focused on localization, working with Arriva, we, we maximize as much as possible. Obviously some things we can't do and there's some components that we have to procure from France. 
So it's a sort of joint effort between ourselves and uh, our shareholder, Arriva. Absolutely. And, and the big talk at the time in these new, new proposed power stations, what effect would that have on, on Kuberg? Well, I, I mean, Kuberg's only got two units, and um, so the more units there are, the better the, the skill levels would be because you can then maintain and re, uh, the resources between refueling outages, for example. At the moment, we're retaining some of the maintenance activi activities by working in America, in the UK, France, Brazil, and other places to retain that. But we could really build up a bigger uh, base of skilled uh, professionals to work on more units at the same time. So that's one aspect. I think the engineering aspect as well, we can become much very, very much more self-sufficient in engineering. At the moment, because of, we've only got these two units, we've also got the threat of uh, other nuclear power stations being built in the world where some of those, the, those resources can be um, tempted away by large uh, packages. So as we get bigger, we should get more sustainable um, base of uh, nuclear engineering knowledge in South Africa. Do, would we, do we have to outsource this or do, would we be able to do it all in-house? The new build? Yeah. No, no, the new build we would definitely rely on, depending on who we, you know, who was chosen as the, uh, the bidder and whether it's the Russians, the Koreans, the French, Japanese, whoever it is, um, we will definitely have to rely heavily to start with on their um, support. And your general views of, of this deal are all the talk of the town at the moment? Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> obviously <laughs> debating amongst my peers in the nuclear business and they also feel uh, that maybe uh, the Russians could have a bad, you know, there's a bad perception about Russia because of the insinuations have been going on between Putin and um, Zuma but um, they may be the best option and they may be the cheapest option they may have the best technology but uh, obviously they're going to have the stigma of this political uh, shenanigans that's been going on uh, elsewhere but uh, I think that it's we need to get on with the nuclear build and, and as soon as possible there's a number of coal-fired power stations that are going to be decommissioned very soon um, there's going to be a lot of un unemployment that's going to be created that so we need to create more employment through another alternative power uh, generation technology. Absolutely. And, and in terms of how many of these plants we, we need, is, 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 are we building too many or, do we, or, or would there be a, a demand for that? Well, as you know, the, uh, we're sitting at junk status at the moment, and uh, <laughs> maybe prior to that is that we, the, the country is not growing as, as fast as we expected. We wanted some decent growth of, over the last two or three years, of three or four, or maybe even five percent, which I think would be normal for a, for a developing country li like South Africa. And unfortunately, because that hasn't happened, uh, actually the demand for electricity has actually decreased. So we're sitting in a little bit of a situation where we don't really need the power today. But obviously our projection is that we will need it in the future. So it's a case of when do you start actually building. And the problem is if you start building too late, <laughs> you're not really taking advantage. And also the world is, uh, there's some competitive pricing out there at the moment. The, the nuclear industry is hungry for new projects, so uh, we should be able to negotiate some quite good deals, I think, uh, if we start now. If we wait till everybody else is picking up, then we, you know, we may not be able to get the same uh, commercial deals. And globally, the uptick of, of, of nuclear in terms of procurement? Sorry, I'm not... I'm not uh, uh, globally, do you see uh, still uh, nuclear being quite a fair? People developing, developed countries... Want very, to very, very much so. I mean, uh, actually, a large number of uh, African countries are becoming much more interested in nuclear. I know that uh, Kenya is setting up something, Tanzania is setting up something, Nigeria has been looking at it. I think, so there's a number of African countries, uh, apart from some of the North African countries that have already looked at it. It's a very important uh, part of the energy mix in a country. You can't just rely on, for example, in Kenya on geothermal. You can't rely on coal just for South Africa because you've got a water issue here. I mean, so you need to build some power stations down at the coast where there's no coal. So now you have to take the coal down to the coast or is it better we build a nuclear power station at the coast using the cold water, which is going to make it quite efficient, and exporting it back up. So there's quite a 
imperative to have a, a very good energy mix in a country. And as you can see, Abu Dhabi's got plenty of oil. What are they doing? They're building nuclear. Saudi Arabia is going to start building nuclear. Iran's part of a nuclear program. Turkey. And they've got all access to a certain amount of um, oil and gas scenario. So you can see that it is an important component of uh, a nuclear, um, I was going to say a nuclear mix, <laughs> a power generation mix. And if, uh, where would be the key locations that would be best suited to, to setting up? Uh, well, it's around the coast, and to obviously the colder the water it is, the better, because it increases the efficiency of the secondary side of the, um, of the plant. Um, I know that uh, the, the first nuclear units will probably be down close to St. Francis Bay, Human Stork uh, area. Um, they've done all the, uh, I think they've done some geotech, they've done some seismic analysis down there, which is also important for, from a power plant point of view. Probably maybe some more units down at uh, Kuburg, on, on the Kuburg site, but also there's other sites that they've sort of targeted around, uh, around the coast. And then, if so, if coal's on the way out, just how long is it going to take for that to take a, a, a back seat, so to speak? Well, it takes, should take, should, uh, seven years to build from the start of a nuclear um, new build program to have the first unit generating. And I think that um, some of the coal fired power stations. They really are re reaching the, the, their end of their life. So some of them are looking at five years, some at ten years, and uh, those things are going to have to come off the grid because otherwise they're going to be far too expensive to maintain them. So it's that sort of crossover point. So you need to start building now seven years to make sure that you've got uh, the increased, if you like, the balance of shutting down and starting up. And clean coal, how, how realistic is that? Maybe you need to explain to me. <laughs> no, I'm, a, I'm a nuclear guy, so how yeah, yeah. clean is clean coal? No, there's, there's new technology that, that makes the, the production of, of the, the coal process cleaner, but if, if the coal itself is not up to a particular standard... Yeah, so as you probably appreciate the uh, technology for, on, a, on a clean coal, uh, uh, using clean coal technology, is more expensive because you have to apply um, a number of ways of burning the coal, but also which is more expensive and more expensive materials are used in it, but also the, the actual uh, emissions type of thing, flue gas desulfurization and stuff that has to be applied. So it makes it more and more expensive. And where the coal is, you've got two problems. One is in the Waterberg, funny enough, there's no water. And down in Mpumalanga, you know, it's a big tourists and fruit and farming area. So you don't really want a lot of pollution down in that particular area. So there's other considerations apart from just looking at new technology on for burning coal. We'd be much better to export the coal, uh, good coal, and um, start cracking on with a nuclear program. Absolutely. And the job creation aspect of, of the nuclear program, uh, will that fill the, the gap with the coal layoffs? It's a different type of... Um, uh, skill structure you need for nuclear. But yes, I mean, and I think it's going to help to advance quite uh, a lot and, and it employs a lot of people. So it's a very, it's quite an intensive business and it's very much on a you know, good level of engineering and good level of uh, technicians and good level of, of, of artisan skills. Whereas sometimes I think that some of the coal fired power stations are maybe not being managed in quite the right way. Having said that, I'm not sure that ESCOM would be very happy for me to say that. <laughs> because uh, obviously ESCOM's been built up on a, on a coal yeah. technology business. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 you always see nuclear as being a little bit scary for them. Absolutely. And, uh, and the safety record of nuclear, uh, what is some of the new technology that's, that's aided that? Sorry, say that again. Making nuclear cleaner and safer as we move forward, what are some of the key drivers to that? I think it's what's quite important. It's uh, nuclear is a little bit like the aircraft industry. You don't want to tinker with it too much. Once you've developed it, tested it, you want and it works, let it do that. We're not going to constantly. There's several initiatives with some new technology in nuclear, and those still take time. High temperature gas reactors, for example. Um, these things take time, they need special materials maybe, they need special ways of operating it and licensing it and things like that. So, 
I, I don't think we should move too quickly. I mean, and especially in South Africa, we should really be replicating something that's working already. And as you know, I don't know if, sorry about my phone, but you probably know that um, Kuburg at the moment is one of the lowest producers uh, into the, onto the Eskom fleet. So if it's the lowest producer on the Eskom fleet, why not try and replicate something similar for the future? So, you know, it's a, it's, for me, it's a no-brainer. It's almost like a Japanese way of, of looking at cars. They don't tinker too much. They keep with a, a reliable design. Well, especially for Africa, let's keep it simple and, and um, let, let, let's, let's have the power where it's needed and around the coast to balance the power from that. And uh, it's, a, it's a good base load. Yes, it's, we also need renewables in the mix uh, without a problem, even though then they may be uh, relatively expensive. It's, it's part of um, South Africans, I think, moral obligation to Africa that we do consider where we, we are the biggest producer of um, power on the African continent, that we are sensitive to emissions and looking and taking the lead on renewables.